Good evening and welcome everyone to this live Q&A session about the Scarborough Subway Extension with Metrolinx. My name is Joseph Thornley. I'm the CEO of 76 Engage, Metrolinx's public engagement partner for virtual consultation. It's my pleasure to be the moderator for this evening's event, and as such, I'll work to keep the event on time, ensure your questions are answered as fully as possible, and make sure as many questions are answered as possible. Now, as we begin, one important note. If you would like to have closed captioning turned on, there's a control at the bottom of your video uh, screen that you're watching. It's a CC. Just click on that and that will turn on closed captioning. Also, before we begin the presentation, let's take a moment to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of Indigenous peoples, including the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. In particular, these lands are covered by 20 treaties, and we have a responsibility to recognize and value the rights of Indigenous nations and peoples. And we should conduct business in a manner that is built on the foundation of trust, respect and collaboration. Metrolinx is committed to building meaningful relationships with Indigenous peoples and to working towards meaningful reconciliation with the original caretakers of this land. Also, before we begin, let's take a moment to talk about safety. I'm sure that we've all heard the tragic news about the deceased worker and we should take a second to think about him and his family. Safety is fundamental to everything that Metrolinx does. And as we know, construction for the SSE project has begun. There will be a high volume of trucks driving through the tran to transport excavated earth in the Shepherd Avenue and McCowan Road area. Please stay alert and be aware of the blind spots for truck drivers. Let's try to ensure that they can see you before crossing the road by the intersection. Now, we've scheduled this evening's event to last an hour. Metrolinx will begin by providing an update on the upcoming construction activities along McCowan Road from Lawrence Avenue to Shepherd Avenue. This is to prepare for the arrival of our tunnel boring machine to help build the subway. The presentation can also be found right below the video if you want to download it for later reference. After the presentation, I'll start the Q&A session by selecting from among the most voted for questions. And if you want to, you can scroll through that and vote up any question that you'd like to see uh, answered. Following the written questions, we'll go over to the Zoom room and you can see there's a yellow join Zoom button under the heading call in with your question. If you're the kind of person who wants to ask your question verbally, you can. Georgina Collymore and Nigel Sandy from Metrolinx will be in the room to be your hosts. And if you go over there, uh, they will turn on your microphone so that you can ask a question verbally. So again, if you've joined us just now, the event is being closed captioned just click on the CC at the bottom of your screen, your video screen, if you'd like to see the closed captioning. So I'd like to introduce our panel now. And uh, with us tonight, uh, we have Jenny Matharu, the program sponsor for the Scarborough Subway Extension. Arid Mohaheg is the senior project manager for SSE. Wojtek Sawicki is the construction manager for SSE. And Thomas Tuzinski, is the Deputy Construction Team Lead for Straw Bag, Metrolinx's constructor for the Advanced Tunneling Contract. Jenny, I believe that you're going to start the presentation. Thank you, Joseph. All right, so happy to be back here again, and thank you everybody for taking the time. So the Straw Bag is our constructor on the Advanced Tunnels Project. Uh, they were awarded the contract in May of 2021, and Prior to actually being awarded the, being awarded the contract, they, we entered into an early works agreement with, with our partner. And what that enabled them to do was to get a head start and they were able to remove the former car dealerships that were there. So if you remember, there was a Nissan dealership and a Ford dealership occupying the northeast corner of Shepherd and McAllen. And so those, um, those uh, buildings have since been removed. And if you do 
uh, drive by the area, there is a large excavation site underway. So that's the launch shaft site. And I believe Thomas is going to speak about it in a little bit more detail soon. But like I said, that's at the northeast corner and there's some great hoarding around the site. And in case you want to take a look, there are some viewing panels. So highly encourage you to get out there. Um, and so, as mentioned, the TBM, the tunnel boring machine, which is the machine that's actually going to be um, moving through and constructing the actual tunnel, is going to be arriving uh, later this year. Um, it's on, it's on, actually, it's on its way over to us. And um, this tunnel is going to be connecting from Shepherd and McCown all the way down to about Eglinton and Midland. And then there's going to be a further extension from Eglinton and Midland connecting to Kennedy Station. And then starting next year, Strawbag is going to be uh, uh, constructing the head walls um, along the tunnel route. And so there are going to be a number of head walls uh, for the emergency exit buildings and for the stations themselves. And the team's going to talk about it in greater detail. I'm just going to pass it off now. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Wojtek Sowicki. I'm the uh, construction manager with the Scarborough Subway on the uh, project delivery team. I just wanted to give you a brief overview of where the project is right now and our uh, next phase is moving forward in the near future. So right now we're looking at the calendar and as Jenny had mentioned, there is a launch shaft currently being excavated at the corner of Shepherd and McCowan. At that time, we've also, as you can see by the schedule, the TBM arrival is actually ongoing right now. The TBM is on a boat from Europe to our uh, facility here in Whitby, and it'll be arriving by the end of the month for offloading and transport to the site. At that time, as it's being assembled, we will be, Straw Bag will begin the work on the head walls along the alignment, and the head walls will be built as the TBM is advancing in advance of the TBM, so they are prepared once before it gets there. That is finished up with the TBM recovery at our next site, which is the uh, extraction shaft at the corner of uh, Midland and Eglinton Avenue. Um, and that next slide, please. Here you can actually see the extra the lawn shaft being um, excavated. On the left hand side is the start of excavation. That's uh, back in September 2021. We are currently on level four of the excavation. On the right hand side, you can see multiple excavators in the bottom of the shaft, as well as tieback machines, which are being utilized to support the side walls. As the, machine, as the excavation goes deeper, these continue to follow in order to ensure that the safety and the uh, integrity of the walls is maintained. Uh, next slide, please. And this here is the current state of our extraction shaft at uh, Midland and Eglinton Avenue. The site is currently boarded up, hoarded off. There's uh, work being prepared in the next coming weeks of our extraction of our uh, demolition crews coming in to clean up the in interior of the buildings, as well as excavators and demolition crews will be moving forward once that work is complete to ensure that any uh, materials that are hazardous are removed um prior to final demolition thank you all right i think we can continue with the next slide and welcome everybody thank you very much for having me here the second time already in the virtually open house and uh, i would like to speak a little bit about our tunnel boring machine so as Wojtek already mentioned as well so the TBM machine is on the way to Canada. Um, it was loaded and uh, departed from the port of Vestorpe from the Netherlands on the last Saturday. And is now currently on the way crossing the Atlantic Ocean to arrive in approximately 12 to 14 days in the port of Oshawa. Um, when the machine arrives there or the vessel arrives there, our team will need most probably something like three days uh, to unload all the equipment from the vessel. And then we will slowly start uh, delivering the first smaller parts to the site, what we are planning to doing actually before Christmas, getting some containers in and some equipment that we will need for the team on the site to build up the TBM machine. And then the main parts of the TBM are scheduled to be arriving at the beginning of January. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, here we, we're showing also two pictures of the loading activities on the, uh, on the vessel. The vessel was called the Jumbo Vision. It's also possible to track it on the Macrolink site to see where the vessel is at the moment. 
and we see how the team on the vessel was uh, securing the parts. We see some parts of the gantry and some some smaller parts from the TBM. So the the TBM was safely uh, stored, transported, and now it's on the way basically to the port. And I would also like to to take the opportunity here also to to once again mention that we have the TBM naming contest ongoing. So we just close out the phase one. We got over 140 names for the TBM, and we're very excited. Uh, to find the, the proper name for the machine, and uh, soon we will start with the phase two to announce the name for the TBM for the naming contest. <coughs> and next slide, please. Uh, yeah, this this slide here shows us the headboard construction. This is one of our main topics uh, I would like to present today. Um, so one of our critical parts for this project here is to to build headboards alongside the tunnel alignment. Um, to understand what a headboard really is. The definition uh, we are having for headwall is it's an underground support structure that creates basically the frame for the station as well as for the emergency exit buildings. And on the right hand side of the layout, we can good see here uh, that we have the tunnel alignment for the Scarborough subway extension and we have the seven emergency exit buildings as well as the three stations, um, the Shepherd station, the Scarborough center and the Lawrence stations. Um, the construction as uh, already mentioned previously, uh, we'll start with the head, first head walls in April 2022. This is our plan that we're having at the moment. And it's very important also to, to give the information that these head walls need to be constructed prior to the TBM arrival of the location. So the TBM will basically drive through the head wall and uh, advance them in the further stages down to Kennedy stations. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here we provide a little bit of a timely overview for the headboard construction and as you can see on the left hand side we structured it from the north to the south. So starting with the first six location in 2022 we will have a couple of activities having in the next year started and then we're planning for 2023 to have four locations to continue with the headboard constructions. The duration of the headboards um, varies between three to seven months always depending on the location and also how much work we have to do on the on each separate location. And it's sometimes also um, in terms of having road closures, uh, utilities diverted, and tree protecting set it up, which then defines also a little bit of timelines for us. Uh, for the next slide, please. Here we have a nice illustrating how a head will be built. So it's, it's basically a drilled concrete pile that we're going to be building and having some, some information how the construction of these headwalls is going to be happening. So we will have a, a small construction crew on site on each headwall location that will basically do the performance of, of building the, the headwall during the regular daytime hours. Um, these activities on the headwalls, of course, include setting up the site installation, um, protecting the sites, having trees protected, cut it, as well as utility relocations. And then finally, of course, the product that we have to build, which is basically the headwall. Um, once the headwall is completed, um, we will bring the previous um, uh, location basically to its original conditions and we'll then um, yeah, replan basically, we'll lay down asphalt or reinstate basically lawns and, and to make the, the, the place looking for the headwall location as it was prior to the visit of our construction team. It's very important that we're talking here about construction. In construction, we have noise and vibration, and it's, it's for us, it's not possible to avoid them, but we can do all the best to mitigate these items. And we will perform on each location different setups and techniques and strategies of noise mitigation. And currently, our technical department is evaluating um, mit noise mitigations for each location that we will also present in the further stage next year. Uh, I think that was the last slide for me, and I would like to hand it over. Thank you very much. Okay, and our next uh, slide oh, is con community engagement. I can talk so. about that. <laughs> um, I'm just not seeing it zoomed in my screen. Sorry about that. Um, my apologies. Just caught up with some family matters here. Um, so uh, following on from what Thomas was talking about with headwall construction, um, we are going to be in the communities. Um, and we are going to be having notices posted on our website about um, about when headwall construction is going to be happening in any specific uh, community. 
uh, we are going from north to south and there was um, there was a, a an image previously where we showed um, the timing of each head wall. So construction notices are going to be mailed and they're also going to be posted and there are going to be a number of other engagement opportunities as well. So we do plan on having pop up events throughout the project areas that are going to be impacted. There are going to be door drops to residents and to businesses and we are here to support all throughout and we are going to have a 24 hour hotline that is available. It's currently up and running right now. And uh, social media is always an avenue for us that uh, we use to communicate what's happening in the communities. And um, one thing that's just not on this is that that we are going to be setting up our community liaison committees as well. They are going to get mobilized um, in the com They are going to get mo mobilized in the communities. And so um, we're looking forward to to engaging more closely with the public. Then. Arad, I'm going to ask if I can maybe um, pass this over to you, and I'm just going to go deal with family. Well, that's not an issue. But I think Jenny's already covered uh, the remainder of the slide, so we can probably move on to Q&A. Okay, excellent. Thank you all. And um, as we've seen, um, sometimes family real life is there even though we're doing this presentation so um we may not see jenny again but arad Wojtek, and thomas are ready to answer the questions so let's go into the written questions first as i said earlier below the video is the join zoom yellow button if you would like to verbally ask a question after we've done the written questions we'll go over to gina in uh, the zoom room and you can ask a, a, a question there by clicking on join zoom but in the meantime the first question uh, is integration with line four the province of ontario has stated that it plans to extend line four to the future shepherd east station on the scarborough subway extension how is this project planning ahead for the future Line 4 extension? Will a Line 4 station be roughed in at Shepherd East? Would one of you like to handle that one? Yeah, please? so I, I can take it. So we are making provisions to allow for the connection between or the interconnectivity between the two lines as part of our design. And that will allow for uh, a Line 4 to be constructed and connecting into our project at Shepherd Avenue in McCowan. Okay, thank you. Next question, Sub uh, platform screen doors. Uh, we know that the Ontario line is going to have doors on the, on the platforms. Uh, one of the questions would like to know whether the stations on the Scarborough subway extension will also have platform screen doors. So I can take this one again to uh, our designs do account for platform edge, edge doors in terms of the platform width and also the the overall requirements. However, given that Scarborough sub extension is an extension of the existing line, uh, those provisions will be made from a space proofing exercise, and that will be to allow for once the remainder of the line has the uh, the doors installed, so that it's one uniform operation. So the first three, these new three, won't get it until the whole uh, line is going to get it. Correct, but from a space exercise, those are all accounted for. Okay, very good. Thank you. Line two future extension. Is Metrolinx planning for a future extension of line two past McCowan and Shepherd north to Finch Avenue East or even to Steeles Avenue East? Um, the questioner understands that funding right now only applies to the current SSE, but is wondering if additional track and associated infrastructure will be built north of Shepherd Avenue to protect for a future extension. So I can take this one again. So the alignment accounts for provisions for that extension. However, given the current scope of the project and the funding, we won't be extending it further north, but it doesn't preclude that extension for the for future. Okay, you're very crisp on your answers and we're going through them quickly. So in a few minutes, we're going to be going over to uh, the Zoom room. Again, as I said, if you want to ask your question verbally, uh, you can just click the yellow Zoom, join Zoom button to go over there and Gina will be there to host you. Transit-oriented communities. 
Is there a planned transit-oriented community development happening at any or all three of the stations? So the, uh, there are plans for uh, transit-oriented communities, but that's based on the, uh, the, the properties that are being taken for the project and for the use of the project. Uh, we look forward to consulting with the community members, city partners, and potentially development partners to create an attractive, inviting plan for the site. But sometimes that will do for every site identified for future TOC projects. And and this may be unfair, but when you said we look forward to consulting, Arad, I know that in the case of the Ontario line, it's Infrastructure Ontario that's consulting on the uh, transit-oriented communities aspects. Um, Correct. Will they be doing that as well, or will Metrolinx be consulting on the TOC? It'll be mostly in pressure Ontario with support from Metrolinx. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, traffic, noise, dust, anywhere there's construction on Bromley, Brymorton, and Ellesmere. During the construction phases, uh, how will the traffic management work along Brimley, Brymorton, Ellesmere? Their number of schools and the current traffic situation is also bad. How will you minimize noise and dust? Uh, can you talk about that, what it's going to be like for people during the construction and your mitigation measure, measures, please? Of course, I, I take this question as, as the constructor. Uh, we are aware of that, that we have noise and dust for each of the location, as well as the traffic that we everybody's facing every day in Toronto. And we will try with our expert, our traffic management and uh, our experts in the subject to uh, create plans. And we're having traffic plans in place already to make like the servants on the roads as, as minimum as possible. So if it's possible to just close one uh, roadway and to keep another one open, we will close it only for the time of duration we really need it. And then we'll shift to the next lane just to keep the duration of the construction as short as possible. We cannot avoid the impact on the traffic, but we will do our best um, to mitigate as best as possible. And to the subject to, to, to noise, noise and dust, um, of course, we know that the construction will create some noise and some dust. As said previously, we will um, we at the moment uh, evaluating some strategies and putting up some temporary noise walls, for example. Also, the equipment that we will have on site will have some mitigation measures to not create too much noise. And as well in terms of dust, so we will water the sites, we have road sweepers in place, and we try to really keep it on a minimum basis there. Okay, and, and do you measure the noise? Do you monitor the noise to, to ensure that it will stay within certain levels, uh, Thomas? Oh. Yes, of course. So, so we have a baseline reading done on each location where we're basically doing construction. And also, also during the construction we're working there, we have monitors all around the sites who are basically recording on a 24-7 base. And we're getting alarms when we're basically exceeding these alarms. And then our, our crew on the site is basically proactively then being informed and then try to find the source and to mitigate the source. So if there is for, for longer duration something, we try really to mitigate it and then basically put the, the, the noise down, let's say. Okay, and and if during construction, if uh, residents uh, find that there is uh, a time when it goes outside of of those uh, parameters, uh, is there a way that they will be able to contact Metrolinks in order to or 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 you in order to report that and and have it attended to? Yes, of course. Like we have a very good uh, communication groups working on this project here, and also thank you very much to all of them. Uh, we are very responding very fast. So we have phone numbers on the hoarding place yes. where people can contact us and they will be directed to the right person. And most of the times we're getting the calls through in a couple of just hours. So so if we get the notification something happened on the site, our team is regularly there and then take them actions basically. So. Okay. And, and on the slide presentation for people who may be living there and be planning ahead, there was the 416-202-7900 number that was listed. Is that the number that people will use to contact Metrolinx all the way through the project? Yes, exactly. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that. I, I slipped in some extra questions because <laughs> I know from other sessions that this is really an important issue for people who are living within the area. And thank you uh, for your answers. Um, washrooms at the stations. Will the stations have washrooms? So I, I can take this one again. Uh, so we follow the typical policies and guidelines that are in place based on uh, the, the need. So typically terminus points or the, the, the end of the line stations do get washrooms and any of the interchange stations. So that'll be uh, where multi 
uh, transit agencies connect to to the subway uh, station, those those locations typically get washrooms. So, in the case of uh, Scarborough sub extension, that'll be the terminus point, the end of the line, and at Scarborough, those are slated to get washrooms. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, so this may this is maybe a tough question for you, but. Uh, what happens if the schedule slips and this project takes longer than expected? Um, does Metrolinx have an agreement with the TTC uh, to ensure that there's prolonged coverage for shuttle bus service to the Kennedy Station? Um, are there built-in penalty clauses? Uh, can you talk a bit about uh, it, making sure that the public is covered if the schedule slips and any measures that are there to uh, discourage schedule slippage? So the, the procurement model that we're undertaking, it's, it's a collaborative one, so that'll, uh, that'll mitigate a lot of the, uh, the, the questions that are being asked in terms of the slippage of the schedule. But at the same time, there will be ongoing coordination with TTC in terms of how the schedule is progressing and how other aspects of the project are moving along to be able to maintain that momentum and also be able to have a recovery plan in case if there are any slippages and typical to any construction contract there will be penalty clauses if deadlines are met or milestones are not met. Okay and is it Metrolinx's policy uh, to report on uh, whether you're you're on schedule as you're going through a project? I saw you had a timeline earlier uh, if there was slippage would you be publishing a revised timeline and alerting the public? Correct. So that'll be all part of the ongoing updates of the project to keep the, the public aware and make sure that we do update on the critical milestones that are that have been communicated. OK, um, so uh, why don't we go over to the Zoom room again? If you've just joined us and if you want to ask a question verbally, um, you can click the join Zoom yellow button and we'll go over to there. And I believe that Georgina Collymore is moderating the Zoom room and may have a questioner for us. Yes, hi Joseph, thanks for the welcome. Um, we have quite a few participants in the Zoom room, about 17 or 18 here. Um, we do have one question is from Corey and that question is, who will operate and perform subway maintenance on the line once completed, TTC or Metrolinx? So I'm thinking maybe I or architect could be able to take that question. I, I, I can take that question, but just to confirm it, the question is with regards to operation and maintenance of the extension once it's in operation, correct? Who operate for once it's complete? Okay, yeah. So uh, TTC will be the operator of the line given the nature of the extension. However, discussions continue between Metrolinx and TTC on the overall operation and maintenance of the facilities. But the intent and the, the, the main goal is to make sure that there is uniformity and consistency between all the locations and everything is operated seamlessly. Great, thank you, Rod. Um, we have another question that just came in from Laura. Laura is asking, by removing Midland and McCowan stations, is the best decision for preparing for the unforeseen? There are 12 plus condos at the areas set to build around Scarborough Town Center. So is one station going to prevent redundant traffic? Is this the best for foot traffic? So, I'm thinking the question here is, will having the new Scarborough Town Center station, will it accommodate for the removal of the two RT stations at Midland and McCowan? Considering that this area is very much um, built up with a lot of condos and a lot of foot traffic to the mall and such. I, I can try to Sorry. answer it. Uh, <laughs> Gina, you were breaking up a little bit, so I'll try to interpolate or extrapolate what the information was, but if the question is similar to the previous questions that we were getting in the previous town uh, open houses or the town halls with respect to operations out of the Scarborough 
location uh, and the proximity to the mall and the, the condo buildings. Uh, the alignment of the project is set. Uh, the, the studies are ongoing and uh, uh, we are coordinating with the city and uh, uh, the mall to make sure that everything is seamless in the, in the area in terms of connectivity and bus operations. Hopefully that answered the, uh, the question. Okay, Georgina is telling me, and she broke up a bit, and I, I appreciate that you, you took a stab at answering the question because I had difficulty listening to it too, or hearing it totally, uh, but I think that you answered it, Arid. Uh, let's go back to the written questions for a second because you, you talked about connections. Um, there are a couple qu uh, questions here about intermodal connections. Uh, so uh, one involves the extension to Highway 7, uh, and is it possible that you uh, will extend uh, it, it beyond Finch and Steel to reach Highway 7 and then connect with the Viva Purple and Green lines? And there's another, and maybe you can talk about this at the same time. Will both Shepherd East and Scarborough Center stations on this extension serve Viva? So can you talk about intermodal connections, please? Sure. So the coordinations with YRT and TTC are ongoing to to make sure that we are, we do understand their future operational intents and needs to be able to accommodate that within the the design parameters that we're we are writing. Uh, in terms of the the future extension to the north, uh, that was answered earlier, but we're not that is not within the base scope of the contract right now or the the, the project. However. The design would allow for that future extension to be done at a later date once funding is available. Uh, in terms of uh, Viva, so Viva is York Region, Rapid, York Region Transit's BRT services. Uh, there are no services of B Viva that connect into or come south of Steeles Avenue along McCowan. However, again, given those ongoing discussions with YRT, those are some, some of the aspects that we're accounting for to make sure that we do understand what the, the plan, the, the operational plans are once the, the project is in service. Okay, thank you for that. Um, coming back to traffic management, Thomas, um, uh, specifically uh, the traffic along Eglinton and McCowan roads, uh, the, the questioner cites the Eglinton Crosstown as an example where pylons are placed in areas and uh, there are disruptions for weeks at a time that in, inhibit traffic flow. Um, what are you able to manage things so that workers relocate the pylons on a day-by-day -day basis and progress as the construction progresses so as to minimize the uh, disruption in the traffic flows? Yes, Joseph, thanks. Um, of course, like on as, as an example of one of our headwalls. So we have a couple of headwalls located who are right in the center of, of a road, let's say, and we have a couple of headwalls located who are outside of a, of a, of a road. So there where we will have basically the impact on the traffic going on. Of course, we will uh, have a site crew on site full time who will also manage and maintenance and also housekeep our traffic arrangement there on site. So we try to limit the, the impact on the roads there as well as we have uh, contractual obligations, basically how long we can close roads there. And it's our goal from Strava to, to keep the impact on the traffic there as, as low as possible. So to answer the question, yes, we will try our best and not to leave some cones just on the street and nobody's touching them. Okay, thank you for that. So let's try the Zoom room again. I think that Gina has a, a question from Chandra uh, in the Zoom room. Gina, is it possible to unmute Chandra to ask her question? And we may be not getting the Zoom room back. Okay, I, I don't think that we are. Oh, hello, do we have a question in the Zoom? Muted us again. Uh, hello? Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Would you like to ask your question, right. please? Yeah, um, so the question is essentially like, would the subway be fully underground or will parts of it be above ground? Like, especially near the 401, um, we've seen a lot of construction over there. Um, so is it sort of like a fortification to put this, put parts of the subway above ground or will it, may, uh, will it mainly be underground? 
Thank you for that question. Who wants to answer that? I can answer it uh, if Tomas or Wojtek are okay with it. So the entire alignment is underground all the way from the terminus point at Shepherd and McCowan uh, till it connects into the existing Kennedy Station. Okay, thank you. And when you talk about McCowan, we also have a question about the actual location of the McCowan Station. Uh, and the question is, will it be where the McCowan Station is? Where will it be? So that is still part of the ongoing design, but it, it is fairly close to that location. It's just north of that location. Okay, uh, so I actually think that uh, we are almost at the end of the questions that we had. There were uh, some redundancy, and as you said, you've answered some already. So one question is about uh, station names. Uh, will the public have an opportunity to give feedback on the station names? It's important to local communities because it represents the local communities. So again, I, I can take this one. So there are policies in place on the naming convention to, to make sure there are consistent approaches for, uh, for uniformity. However, those are typically done based on uh, simplest possible ways uh, or the, the nearest crossing street or the, it's something that relates to the community. So we do try to follow those uh, policies, uh, but we look forward to getting feedback from the community on the proposed names. And so there will be a consultation where the public will have an opportunity to talk to you about the names. Correct. Okay, thank you. There's another question uh, that was written into the Zoom room uh, to Gina, and it's from Laura, and it is, where can we see the studies uh, for this project? So a lot of the studies are kept within the project. However, uh, this, some aspect of them can be made public. A lot of them feed into the design, uh, such as traffic management or uh, uh, structural analysis that, that are done or traffic modeling or pedestrian modeling a lot of those feed into the ultimate design so those are not necessarily published but a lot of the other documents where it's uh, related to uh, public consultation uh, some aspects of traffic that may be impacting the community those are published in various stages Okay, and and they would and for those that are published, would they be on MetroLinks.com? They would typically be part of the uh, the pro environmental project reports or the uh, amendments to the environmental assessments. And and as a member of the public, uh, where would I find that? Those are those are on MetroLinks's website. Okay, all right, very good. Thank you. Uh, so I think that we're almost done. Uh, there was a question that I glossed over earlier, um, and that is when will the names of the tunnel boring machine uh, be uh, published? And uh, I think uh, that the answer to that probably relates to the second phase of the uh, contest to name them. and. I believe you were telling me just before we started that voting will probably start in the next day or two. But if you go to the top of this page, you'll see uh, the page where the video, you'll see a get engaged button. And if you go there, you'll find information. You'll see uh, the results of the first uh, or the the first tunnel boring uh, machine naming contest and a place where you'll be able to go to vote on the short list of questions. There's the short list of names. And when I say questions, I believe that uh, we have one last question in the Zoom room from Madawa uh, and Georgina. I would, are you able to read that question? Shall we take a, a shot at your audio one more time? Hi, or, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm living beside the McCowan Road and uh, it's between Lawrence and Ellesmere. And um, I have two questions. So one is that when the construction happening in this area, what, what is the time, uh, like timeline for the to tunnel to go around this area? Okay, um, 
okay, the first question I would like to answer. So we starting tunneling works in uh, June of next year, so something in the summer around, and it takes us around 21 to 22 months to go up to Kennedy Station, so not a full two years, let's say. Um, I would say in this location, we will be most probably something like after one and a half years, so coming towards to 2023 in the winter time, I would suggest. But this is at the moment just a, a prediction, let's say, on the time schedule that we have, but that it's, it's foreseen for the moment. Okay, thank you. And my second question is, since I'm right beside uh, McCowan Road, um, am I able to like make uh, left turns like across uh, to the other side or when the construction is happening, is it just one-way traffic uh, going north or going south? It's a little bit difficult to answer this question for the moment because I don't know the particular location there. But uh, for sure, our traffic management team will take a look into it and provide some 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 roads uh, to turn left or right. I, as I was saying, at the moment, it's a little bit difficult for me to, to evaluate at which location it is. But we will try to make our best that the traffic is uh, directed in the right directions with the right signage and that everybody goes fluent there. Okay. And sir, if you if you would like uh, to pursue a more precise answer, there's a green contact us button at the top of the page right above the video. And there's a form right there where you could just uh, fill in uh, the, the message form and it will go through to the uh, project team, and then they could get back to you and uh, with your and deal with your specific question. Uh, so you can find that right at the top of the page. And um, uh, that's it from the Zoom room. While we were talking, a couple more questions, written questions, came in, and because we're running uh, so far ahead of schedule, let's ask them. Uh, the first one is quite straightforward, and it is, what about the environmental impact assessments? Uh, so can you talk a bit about the environmental impact assessments for the th this project? I assume uh, that the question is really asking, where can we see them and, uh, and, and, and what's in them? So the environmental assessment is posted on MetroLinks' website, and any updates or amendments to it are also will be posted and have been posted to Metrolinx's website. So all those informations can easily be found. Okay. Okay. And thank you. And and it, and it's unfair to expect that you know exactly where it is. But uh, to the person who asked the question, uh, the team from Metrolinx is providing written answers to the questions after the event. So I'm sure that what they'll do is they'll actually give you the link uh, in here so that you can find that particular, uh, so that you can find the particular uh, reports that you're asking for. So uh, thanks, Aaron. I didn't, I wasn't suggesting that you should have a URL sitting on the tip of your tongue. That's, uh, let me go to what I think will be the last question. What are the current plans uh, for the SC, uh, for the Scarborough Center Station bus terminal? The questioner uh, who just put this in a couple minutes ago says there's been news coverage of a planned design for the bus terminal at Scarborough Center Station, which made it look like the bus terminal would be so massive that it would be inconvenient for riders. Um, is this an issue? Has it been resolved? Uh, the bus terminal here is an important local and regional bus hub and should have a good and efficient design. Could you talk about the design for the Scarborough Center bus terminal, please? Sure. So the, the design is ongoing. Uh, we are at a stage that's called reference concept design. Uh, we're, we're determining feasibility of the locations and the, the required footprint. Uh, however, detailed design will be done once uh, our proponent uh, is on board for the stations, rail and systems contract. Uh, Scarborough Center will have one of the biggest bus terminals along the Scarborough sub extension line. Uh, however, that is accounting for interconnectivity of Jura and Region Transit, uh, coal, as well as TTC. So it, it is a big facility, but a lot of effort is going into uh, making sure that it's being coordinated with the City of Toronto from a site plan perspective and uh, aesthetic to make sure that it blends in with the future plans. Okay, stay tuned. Correct. All right, thank you so much. And that 
is the last of the questions that we received tonight. Uh, you've been very economical and precise in your answers. The questions were very uh, focused. Uh, I hope for those people who ask questions that you indeed got answers that satisfied you. If you have still other questions, you can add them after the meeting. Metrolink staff will be going through and, and answering questions. And again, as I said earlier, that contact us button up there is indeed there for the purpose that if you would like to talk to Metrolinks about a specific issue, uh, you can contact them. Uh, the tunnel boring machine contest will open in the next uh, day or two, I think. So uh, check the get engage button here, come back. I know there was, uh, as Thomas said, a lot of interest, a lot of en enthusiasm over the names. And so you'll have a chance to weigh in on the final name. Thank you for coming out tonight. Thank you for participating. Thank you for caring. Please stay safe and have a good night. Goodbye.